Praise the Lord. Welcome to this Sunday series on long-suffering and patience. We pray you have been long-suffering and not that you have been short-suffering. Suffer long, stretch in love and in your faith in the Word of God. We have started this series by showing and teaching on the Greek words for patience and then we covered the Hebrew over the last week on the words of Iraq. Masak and Ab, which occurs in the Old Testament. As we cover these words to show a definition or description of what true patience is, we will now look at various lives of the men and women of God in the Bible to learn how to be patient like they were in God and also to learn from times and places where like us as humans, they experience a little bit of impatience and thus we learn from their lives praying that we grow and to be more like Jesus to which all humans will have to conform to. Since we mentioned the life of Moses the last time, we like to look at the life of Moses and uh, then perhaps the uh, life of Job and then all the other lives that we have to learn patience from. For the book of Hebrew chapter 6 verse 12 spe speaks about how we were to be like them and uh, through faith and patience possess the promises of God. So let's look at the life of Mo Moses and learn where patience worked for him and where patience did not work for him. Uh, or rather, he showed some impatience. In his life, he lived a life of 40 plus 40 plus 40 years. Altogether, he lived 120 years. And because of his exceptional walk with God to the extent that he saw the back parts of God's glory, God made an exceptional case of Moses and took him out from Hades where supposedly all men are to go and brought him to be able to walk and talk with him so that even before Jesus went to Hades to set all those on Abraham's bosom free taking captivity captive Moses was already free about in the spiritual world doing the things of God as you saw here on the Mount of Transfiguration also if he were in Hades, he would not be able to be in the Mount of Transfiguration, obviously. So let's study the life of Moses. Moses was chosen and predestined even before he was born or from the womb. God protected him. God arranged all the circumstances in his life such that when there was a decree to slaughter and kill every Hebrew baby in the land of Egypt. Moses' life was spared when the mother beat, built a uh, little container like, made from reeds and placed it in the water and surrendered him to God's hand. And it was the angels who brought it and caused the water to flow towards the princess of Egypt who was at that time using the river for a cleaning and bathing. When she saw baby Moses, she adopted baby Moses as her own son. And Miriam, Moses' older sister, was watching where the baby went. So when she saw that the princess of Egypt took the baby and wanted the baby to herself, she quickly ran to the princess and said, Do you need a nurse for the baby? And of course the princess says, Yes. And so she quickly ran and got her mother. And uh, in the end, Moses was nursed by his own mother, though adopted by the princess. Thus he was preserved while all the other babies were slaughtered. What a unique calling. What a protection that Moses had even before he was conscious and could make a decision for, us, for himself. Our story of Moses starts 
in the book of Acts, chapter 7, in the history that was given by Stephen. Acts chapter 7. And um, because the book of Exodus tells a baby story that I just described and summarized for you. But as Moses grew, it tells us here in uh, verse 20. It says, At this time Moses was born, and was well pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. So he was with his uh, mother for three months as he was nurse. And then the princess of Egypt took him and to the palace to be brought up like all the other Egyptians. Moses, through visions we saw time to time, from time to time, did visit his mother when he was an adult. He knew of his Hebrew heritage. And uh, among the Egyptian army, there was um, a division made up from the Hebrew people. And so Moses was like captain over this group. And uh, he, he led them together with uh, some of the other Egyptian soldiers. So we have here that uh, it says in verse 22, And Moses was learning in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. Although Moses later told God in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4 that he is not a man that can make great speech and he is not eloquent, the Bible says here he was actually very eloquent, mighty in words and mighty in deeds. So that is another way of saying he was very eloquent in handling words. In terms of his deeds, the book of Josephus speaks to us of uh, some of his early life. In the book of Josephus, it talks about some of the works of Moses. And Josephus in the book of Antiquities of the Jews uh, mentioned in uh, chapter 10 how Moses made war with the Ethiopians. And these are traditions and stories from the Jewish archive that Josephus collected together. That is known to all the Hebrew people, but not in our Bible. So it says here in Josephus chapter 10 that um, Moses, when he was born, uh, he, he was uh, brought up uh, by the Egyptians and then during his time there was a war between uh, the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians seized and carried out uh, the eff carry off the effects of the Egyptians, who in their rage fought against them, revenge of the Aphrons they had received from them. But being overcome in battle, some of them were slain and they ran away in a shameful manner. Whereupon the e Ethiopians pursued them and the story goes on that uh, when the Egyptians uh, were looking as to who should lead the army, in the end the king of, e king of Egypt uh, was told by some of the soothsayers and all that that uh, the Hebrew Moses should lead the army. And so he commanded his daughter, the princess who adopted Moses, to produce him that he might be the general of their army. And the princess make uh, the king swear that uh, he would do no harm to Moses. So he brought Moses to the king and uh, supposed that his assistance would be great advantage to them. Then it tells us that Moses, um, at the persuasion of both Termutis uh, and the king himself, cheerfully understood the business, he's an adult by now, and the sacred scribes of both nations were glad. Those of the Jews, uh, those of the Egyptians, that they would at once overcome their enemies by his valor, and that by the same piece of management, Moses would be slain. So they were actually were hoping that Moses also would be killed because the princess protected him, but they know he was a Hebrew and they looked down on him and they hoped that he was going to be killed in this little war that is mentioned that is not in the Bible. And it says here that. Uh, 
in the end Moses was uh, their general and Moses uh, took and led his army uh, before the, uh, these enemies and apprised how to attack them. He did not march by the river but by land where he had a wonderful demonstration of his sagacity, that is his intelligence, for which the ground was difficult to pass over because of the multitude of serpents which it produces in vast numbers. And it tells us that uh, Moses invented a wonderful stratagem to preserve the army safe and without hurt. He made baskets like on the arcs or siege and filled them with ips, some sort of material, and carried them along with them, which animal is the greatest enemy to serpents imaginable. Uh, and so they, they managed to go through uh, the wilderness uh, area to attack the Ethiopians. And then he carried some of these, uh, he caught some of these serpents and these uh, animals. Uh, and then it says that he let them loose uh, against the enemy. And so as the Egyptian, he came upon the Egyptians uh, before they expected him. And he beat them, deprived them of the hopes that, uh, that they had success against the Egyptians. And finally he conquered, overcame them. And it says here uh, that uh, Moses uh, continued to lead the army and um, uh, there was uh, all these Ethiopians and they fell before him. And um, this is an interesting part that was there, that is mentioned. Uh, interesting part here is um, uh, this sentence here that however while Moses was uneasy at the armies lying idle for the enemy does come into the battle uh, this accident happened Tabis was the daughter of the king of the Ethiopians she happened to see Moses as he led the army near the walls and fought with great courage admiring the subtlety of his undertakings believing him to be the author of the Egyptian success when they had before despair of recovering their liberty and to be the occasion of the great danger the Ethiopians were in when they had before boasted of their great achievement, she fell deeply in love with him and upon the prevalency of that passion sent him the most faithful of her servants to discuss with him about the marriage. He thereupon accepted the offer on condition she would procure the delivering her of the city, gave her the assurance of an oath to take her to his wife, that when he had once taken possession of the city, he would not break his oath to her. No city was uh, agreement made that it took effect immediately and Moses cut off the Ethiopians and gave thanks to God, consummated his marriage, led the Egyptians back to their own land. So you didn't know this, right? This is chapter 10 of the Antiquities of the Jews. Interesting uh, in some of these stories and apparently uh, uh, a lot of things took place and uh, before the story in the Bible. Then we have this uh, Bible story of uh, Moses in verse 23 after all these words and deeds. In verse 22 you see he was mighty in words and deeds. So indeed he fought battles, he fought wars and he was a general among the Egyptian army. In verse 23, when he was 40 years old he came into his heart to visit his brethren the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Man, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pursued him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? At this saying, Moses fled, and he dwelt in the land of Midian. So he totally left his life in Egypt. And he started a new life, as you saw the story in the book of uh, Exodus, in uh, Jethro's house. What happened here? Moses knew that he was called. Moses had some success as a general in the Egyptian army. And it says the reason why Moses slay the Egyptian, the Egyptian soldier that was tormenting the Hebrew, was to protect the Hebrews. He knew, maybe not fully defined yet, he knew he had something to do 
or some calling to help the Hebrew people rise up to protect them. Uh, when he was rejected by the very Hebrew that he saved, and in fact, this Hebrew was the one who did wrong to the other Hebrew. You know, when people are wrong, try to cover up and, and go against Moses. Yeah. And uh, because Moses was the one who stopped him doing the wrong thing. Uh, and unfortunately, he did not like Moses and he made that command and Moses felt that, okay, what he tried to do did not succeed and he fled. After all, when you saw the background that I read just now, he was actually disliked by the king and uh, he disliked by the Egyptian people even though he had all the success and he knew if they find out about him killing an Egyptian they will come after him so he fled of course the New Testament looks at it differently in the book of uh, Hebrews and say he didn't flee just because he frightened the king he actually flee to seek God to seek something and true enough Moses actually was seeking what his life was about. Just like many of you out there, you're seeking. Why am I here? Why was I born? Why am I in this circumstance that I, I am in now? What is God's will in my life? And you might discern some part of God's will like Moses, but did not understand all of it. And here, unfortunately, is a story of Moses being impatient. In his impatience, he killed an Egyptian. And his whole life has to turn around. And if, if it was true what the antiquities of the Jews said, that Moses had a wife and a family, he left everything behind. And he went straight to uh, the region of the wilderness. Totally cut off everything and went off. So he, it must have been a painful loss. It must have been a painful decision, knowing that if he stayed behind, if what Josephus said was true, that he had a family, his whole family would have been killed. Because in those days, judgment was on everyone. Uh, when one is guilty, the whole family is slaughtered. So he fled perhaps to uh, escape and perhaps the uh, preserve whatever was still there. We do not know. But the Bible in Hebrew says the reason he fled was to seek out, to seek God out. He did not flee just because of fear. He's a fighter. That's an interesting comment on Moses. But he lost everything. He gave up everything. What were the exact words of the Bible in terms of uh, the story? In the book of uh, Hebrews, where you have all the roll call of faith mentioned and um, says these words about Moses in verse 24 Hebrews 11 by faith Moses when he became of age refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt and all of his life in Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So Moses went forth to seek God, to seek his calling. Every one of us, at a certain point in our life, if you have not really done so, must seek God as to the purpose why you were born on the earth, why you came to the earth. Do not let this natural light that we have blind you to the fact that every one of us came with a mission on the earth. Fulfill the mission. So Moses went forth seeking that. There was no answer for God for 40 years. The book of Exodus tells us this situation as he left into the 
wilderness says that uh, he helped Jethro's daughter Zipporah and um, then who this priest of Midian Jethro had seven daughters so of course he behaved and looked like Egyptian that's why they say who helped you uh, to get all this water they say an Egyptian in chapter 2 verse 19 help us so Jethro says where is he why didn't you why did you leave him bring him here and verse 21 Moses was content to leave with a man he gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses she bought him a son he named he called his name Gershom and he said been a stranger in a foreign land and so life goes on for the next 40 years and Moses was in the wilderness tending to sheep and cattle he had 40 long years of waiting on God so on the one hand at the end of his first 40 years he showed impatience but the next 40 years that was like Moses was contented with his life he still loved God. I'm sure he still prayed to God. He still waited on God. And he still must from time to time have some connection with his family back home, with Aaron, with Miriam, with his mom and dad. But otherwise, he was happy, satisfied, contented to live the life of a herdsman. That is patience. You know one of the ways where you stretch yourself and give yourself the ability to wait a long long time is to settle down, wait upon God, don't be in a hurry to do anything, go anywhere and just be contented with a simple life that God gave to you. While waiting for the great and mighty thing that God can bring forth. Forty long years. Oh, I cannot imagine what the forty long years were like, day in, day out, being a happy man, with two sons, and uh, living his life out in the wilderness. No one, no one can really know what it's like. And forty years is a lifetime. It's almost like he made his life as a herdsman. And um, when, by the time God appeared to him in the burning bush, Moses was contented. He was not asking for more. In this area of his life, I call it the death of a vision leads to true vision. He has to die to himself and how he wants to carry out God's will. And then is he ready for the vision that God has for him. You know how in this life, there are some people who got no movement, they're contented with life as it is. While others, including myself, we won't be satisfied just with a contented life of good food, clothing, shelter because it's something that drives you to do something. You know that you're not here just to enjoy this life. You're here to finish, to do something. I'm sure Moses is like that. But yet having the ambition and having that drive and having the, the vision consume him did not prevent him from saying, all right, if this is of God, let God bring it forth. In the meantime, I will just uh, live my life contently. That's what Moses is. Moses definitely is a man of vision, a man of mission, a man uh, that is passionate. From uh, the book of Hebrews 11, you can see he's a passionate man who seeks after God. But he mixed that with an element of contentment. All of us need that area of contentment so that we are not pushed in our own self impatiently to do things that God never asks us to do or do things too fast. 
So the first 40 years of Moses' life, it made him a bit impatient. The next 40 years of his life give him patience. So much so that by the time God says, I'm going to send you now with these signs and wonders, and then when Moses is sent another one, God gets angry at him because Moses doesn't want to move from where he is now. He's contented, too contented now. So finally at the age of 80 years, he obeyed God. It was not an easy thing. And when he went forth to went forth to Egypt to begin the, the fulfill his call, finally the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob was working and Moses now had a rod in his hand. He must have gone back to his family, told them about God's call. It was not immediate. It probably took roughly about six months to a year for him to finally obey God and go back to Egypt. And in his confrontation with the king, Moses again has to learn patience. And as he went forth, and that story is in chapter 4, he said goodbye to his Jethro and in his first encounter he already got Aaron on his side. He must have visited his family in chapter 5. Moses and Aaron went and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh, this is old bad Pharaoh, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I do not know the Lord. Now where let Israel go? And then again, the, uh, when he says, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Go back to your labor. And then Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters and the people that they should not give straw to the Israelites to be brick, but let them gather their own straw, let them make their own bricks, but they must not like what they are making. In other words, their work became harder. And all the people were upset and angry. They said, Moses, you came to deliver us. Now you make our work harder. Before we can make straw, now we must also gather the bricks and also make straw. And uh, so the people went after Moses. And the people were upset at him. And... Um, so when Pharaoh said all these things, uh, the officers of the children of Israel, the leaders came and told Pharaoh, why are you doing this to us? You're beating us, not got no straw. And they say, you're idle. You got no, not enough work. That's why you want to go and sacrifice to your God. And then you must make the same amount of bricks. But this time we don't give you the straw. You go and get the straw yourself. When they came back from, from talking to the king of Egypt, they were furious. They were angry. And so they blasted all their anger at Moses in verse 20. They came out from Pharaoh. They met Moses and Aaron who stood there. And they said to them, Let the Lord look on you and judge. Because you make us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of servants, and to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Look, they make their, our work harder. They want to kill us. And you make our life more difficult. Wow. If you, have you ever been on the receiving end of someone's anger? If you have not, then you have not lived this life. You know, when you live this life, sometimes people get angry at you whether right or wrong. And if you are on the receiving end of anger, it takes a lot of patience to stretch and absorb and contain it. Take a meek man. So Moses' meekness, later on he was the meekest man in the world, but he, he was learning meekness, growing in it. So he reacted like all human beings. He came to the Lord in verse 22 and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on these people? Why is it that you sent me? Since I came to Pharaoh, he has only done evil and wicked things to your people. So Moses was complaining to God. 
And then God said to Moses in chapter 6, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. With a strong hand, he will let them go. With a strong hand, he will drive them out of the land. And so, uh, he told Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, let the children of Israel go out. And Moses spoke before the Lord, Children of Israel have not heeded me. How then will Pharaoh heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Give them a command for children of Israel, and for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. God still gave the command. And um, it came to pass on that day that God says, Okay, you use Aaron to speak and, uh, and the two were to do the thing together. And um, then he says, Perform these signs. Perform these signs and give them these signs. And uh, when you speak to Pharaoh, show a miracle. Show a miracle. Take your rod and cast it down. And uh, so he went forth and did that. He went forth, threw the stick down, became a snake. Surprisingly, Pharaoh's magician could also do the thing. Then there was a fight between Moses' rod, which was now a snake, and the, their uh, magician's rod, which also became snakes. And they were fighting until Moses' rod swallowed all the other snakes. And that's an amazing display of metaphysical miracles turning a rod into snake. I was surprised that Aaron's uh, uh, Pharaoh's magician could do the same thing because in those days in those days there were also evil powers that were ruling and reigning. See there was a time in uh, the early years of mankind when the fallen angels came and then demonstrated a lot of tremendous things that they astound humans and they did a lot of evil. There were giants in the land. It was, can I say, in quote unquote, it was quasi magical kind of situation because supernatural laws were defined natural laws. And then down to the time after the flood, uh, it says there were giants before giants, giants after, so there must be another infiltration. And the infiltration was still there in that time of fallen angels working behind humans that's caused all this potential uh, metaphysical signs and wonders done even by the evil people. We will come to another time during this end time when the supernatural, both good and both evil, will again work. We are now in a scientific time when people don't believe in things that is outside the law of physics. But the supernatural will be once again permitted by God to defy our laws of physics and supersede it. Anyway, the story here is of Moses. And let's analyze this incident. Why did Moses complain and talk to God and then God assured him that he will free them by a strong hand? When the officers of the children of Israel, the leaders, came and, confront, and confronted Pharaoh and Pharaoh told them you're idle and make them work twice as hard and they were so furious and angry at Moses and Aaron and then Moses came to God and complained why when I, you send me to them now they are, they, they are worse off than before what is happening here Moses had to learn a simple lesson which we all must learn that when God sent you to do something you might have to be persistent to do it because there is resistance from the enemy. Why? What do you expect? What did Moses expect? Moses probably expect, yeah, I go to Pharaoh say, let my people go. Pharaoh say, yes, okay, I go. Is that what you're expecting in your life? Do you have patience? Are you expecting that when God tells you, uh, oh, go to this place, I will prosper you, you go there. Yeah. Oh, okay, Pshum, prosperity just drop on you. No resistance, no testing, no trial, no temptation, no need to exercise patience. Then you haven't learned the most basic of all truths. By faith and patience, 
you possess or you inherit the promises of God. Having done all that you need to do, you must have patience or endurance to receive the promises of God. Hebrews 10 verse 36. It is important for us to learn this lesson that when God asks you to do something, there is always something challenging it. When the Israelites were ready to cross the land of uh, Canaan, they, um, they got 10, 12 spies to go in. To their surprise, it was true, it was the land of milk and honey where all the trees and fruit trees there, there is this evidence of a big bunch of grapes carried by two men. But they said, God didn't tell us about the giants in the land. Why? What do you think? God sent you to the land of Canaan, the promised land, all oh, easy. Now, here it is, darlings. Here we are. No sweat, nothing. No battle, nothing. You're expecting that in your life in Christianity now? You see, but, 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 but Jesus died on the cross for us. Yes. But you need to learn to exercise faith and works of faith and patience. Because there is an enemy that wants to stop you from possessing and inheriting and receiving what God has for you. You have to be like the persistent widow. Always. God says this is it. This is it. God says this is mine. I will hold my ground. I will declare it unto God that here I am to take that which is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you must stand your ground. So we have Moses again learning the simplest of all truth that you need to be persistent. Don't expect an easy job. You know, Pharaoh let God says let my people go. Pharaoh say okay why? When you go forth to do your business that God asks you to do, to do your ministry that God asks you to do, to plant a church that God asks you to do, to reach out evangelism that God asks you to do, that you think that when you go out, that everything will say, okay, what kind of Christianity do you have? You need, there will be a challenge that will require you to have endurance, stretchability, faith, persistence, patience. And then you inherit the promises of God. So let's learn from the life of Moses. He changed. He became a different person. And then he started learning how to lead the people of God out into that promised land. Now we go to another place in the Bible where Moses needed to exercise patience. And this is an incident that we touch on in the last sermon, Numbers chapter 11. When the people's complaining, complaining, and complaining got to Moses until he was so irritated and so fed up that he complained to God. This is why in Numbers chapter 11 verse 10 to 15 until he, he says uh, did I give birth to all these people? Why are you asking me to take care of them? He says I cannot do this alone it's too heavy for me and he says I'm not able to bear these people if you treat me like this kill me and he says I don't want to see my own wretchedness and that's why God said gather 70 people take the spirit of this upon you and share it with these people and anoint them so here is Moses reaching the end of his ropes. He stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch until he says, oh, I cannot stretch anymore. He need more patience. But when you pray a prayer like that, it's dangerous. So if ever, he learned from the life of Moses that whenever you reach the end of your ropes, you cannot stretch anymore. The, you don't feel you got any strength to go on. Do this thing that I always do. Father God, give me more strength. Give me more grace. Expand my spirit to receive more of your grace, more of your strength. 
and you wait on the Lord, He always will. You will discover that when God call you to do anything, He already gave you the spirit and the strength to do those things. Moses didn't know he has the anointing of 70 people behind him. Upon him, he could do the work of 70 other people. He probably didn't realize that. See, sometimes God anoints us or give us ability, give us grace. And then just because we are human, we reach the end of our emotional strength, the end of your natural strength, and uh, you're not tapping on the spiritual strength that God has already put upon you. Moses didn't realize he got the strength of 70 people upon him already. He could have tapped upon it. Instead, it was taken and passed on to 70 others, the spirit that was upon him. Every time God put you through a test, every time God put you through a temptation or trial, you will find that before God allows that, He will have given you the anointing and the unction and strength. Just as God never allowed the devil to come that near to Jesus, to tempt and test Him for 40 days and 40 nights, until after, after, he received the anointing upon. So you never know what you have unless you ask God in prayer, wait upon God and draw out from you the grace that God has for you. Just like Paul prayed to God three times. I cannot take this, he says, when the fallen angel was, was uh, tormenting him. And God allowed that for test for Paul to stretch further. And then, this time God was good to him. When he prayed three times, God keeps saying, My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. And Paul discovered, yes indeed, the grace of God was in his life. It was more than sufficient for any troubles or situation he faced. And then he says, He will triumph over them. He will give thanks to God. When he is weak, then he is strong. So in his weakness, he found God's strength in him. Similarly, in Moses' time, he reached the end of himself and then he lost some part of his anointing to the others. Don't lose your anointing. Don't lose your destiny. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Because if you do, that anointing may be taken and passed on to others. Instead of complaining, tap upon that which God has. The very next chapter after this shows forth that Moses has developed very good qualities. It says in chapter 12 of in chapter 12 of the book of Numbers, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And so they said, Has the Lord spoken only to Moses? Here they were actually challenging Moses hearing from God. Moses was a prophet and they say we are also prophets. Nothing to do with Mrs. Moses. I don't know why they dragged her in. They could have, you know, just kept that aside. And if they don't like her because she's black or Ethiopian, then that said nothing to do with the, with the fact that they were prophets and Moses was a prophet too. They were challenging Moses' ability to hear God and Moses being in authority. Aaron, I don't know whether he knew at this time, Aaron's life was saved by Moses. When he did the golden calf sin. God wanted to kill him. In the book of Deuteronomy, it mentions that. God wanted to kill him. And Moses prayed for him and God spared his life. You know, Aaron would not be alive if not for Moses. What about Miriam? Well, Miriam wouldn't be where she is if she had not followed Moses. Although Miriam was the one who brought uh, the the mother to nurse uh, Moses. He did some good things. But 
how easy it is for an older sister to sort of dominate over their baby brother no matter how she has to learn one thing it's not chronological age that counts it's spiritual age it is not natural positions that count it's spiritual position so perhaps all her life she's always been the uh, you know the big sister and uh, Moses of course when he was challenged by both Moses, uh, Miriam and Aaron who were both older than him it says here in verse 3 now the man Moses was very humble more than all men who were on the face of the earth so in this particular case Moses didn't, didn't say anything because after all he was Titi there was Kaka and there was the big uh, big Cheche and um, these are just Chinese words for big sister, big brother and he was small little tiny brother so they are exercising their natural authority they exercise what they don't like and like and then they challenge Moses authority and prophetic office dangerous thing to do and God spoke to all of them and God says if you are prophets I will speak to you as prophets that is from uh, verse 6 all the way to verse uh, 8 I will reveal myself in dark sayings and parables but he says Moses Moses is my servant seemingly like implying he is my friend he is more than a prophet he has a relationship with me and Aaron repented and God knew where the source was Miriam suffered leprosy and when Moses prayed for them when Moses prayed for them heal her God says the situation is like the father spit on the daughter that means God show his displeasure I don't know what Miriam and Aaron were trying to do maybe they want more recognition maybe they want more authority maybe they just want to challenge Moses and put him in his place but God protected Moses Moses had been faithful in doing all that God asked and Miriam would have died of leprosy if Moses didn't pray for her in this particular case Moses was patient well has our love for his sister and brother and from what we have seen of Moses he really loved his family so Moses loved the sister so much that when he saw her she had leprosy he forget about all the trouble she caused and say please heal her so in this particular case Moses did well his humility came true which is something to learn we learn from his failures we learn from his success humility is the key as long as we learn to humble ourselves let God defend you let God justify you you don't have to justify or defend yourself just be humble and it's very hard to quarrel with a humble person it's very hard to try to stir and cause strife with a humble person Moses never reacted he just listen kept quiet remain humble they were challenging him but he he just remained humble in the end God showed up defended Moses so let's learn one thing I believe if we don't have humility we cannot be patient see patience is the quality to be able to stretch when people throw things at you you're patient people lose their temper at you you're patient that patience must be undergirded by humility 
Humility is to die to self. You live no longer for yourself. You live only for God. Your reputation is not important. The reputation of God is important. So you're only protective of God, not even of yourself. This demonstration of great patience was possible because humility was the essence of what Moses was experiencing. In the end, after the time of restoration of Miriam and Aaron, his brother, things go on. But they were still in the wilderness. They were still subject to the complaints and all the grumbling of all the Israelites, you know, behaving like little kids, little children, and the three million of them, except for Caleb and Joshua. And there they were, constantly, constantly coming at Moses. One fine day, which is nothing new under the sun, they don't have water. I mean, wilderness don't have water, so common, right? And in chapter 20 of the book of Numbers, by that time, Miriam has died, she was buried in verse 1 and verse 2, there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. Now Aaron also got into the picture and they said, why must we die here? Why must we die here? Look, we don't have water, you know. And it is, there's not a place for figs, vines, pomegranate, water to drink. They say what they don't have. But you know what they have? Quails every evening, manna in the morning. So much better than all the things they wish for. Are you someone who look at what you don't have, rather than look at what you have? Are you a grateful person who gives thanks? You know, a person who gives thanks, will always look at what they have and give thanks and don't worry about what they don't have. A person who is complaining will always look at what they don't have and keep complaining what they don't have. No pomegranates, no fakes, no water, no, no meat and all those things. Today, I hope this is not too late in your Christian life. Hope this is not too late to change your character in this end time. Are you someone who keep looking at what you don't have and wish to have and complain? Or are you someone who look at what you have and are faithful to it and keep giving thanks? There can only be one that is correct. It is time in our life, in our character, in this move, to be Christians who look at what we have, don't worry about what we don't have, and give thanks. And give thanks. And if you take that route, you will never more say a word of complaint out of your life. Because in everything you will find something good to give thanks for. And that lack of giving thanks and complaining, 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 got to Moses. I mean, Moses got feelings too. He's a human. And God says, take the rod in verse 8, you and your brother, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, it will use water. So he had to speak and say, let water come out from you. Water will come out. But, Moses was upset. Moses was angry. For just that short moment, he went to the rock and look at his words. That show he's very upset and angry. Here now, you rebels. <laughs> they call them rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? <laughs> oh, he was angry. He was angry. Oh, Moses, at this point, you could have been slow to anger by this time. He was furious. He was angry. He had to throw his temper at the rock. The only thing is Paul and allegory. The rock represents Jesus. He already struck the rock once and has water. He don't have to strike 
again because Jesus only has to die once. And so that's Paul the allegory and the prophetic picture. Moses has to be punished by God. By the grace of God, water still flow out. Then God has a private talk with Moses and Aaron. Because you did not believe me, to hold me holy or hallow me in the eyes of children of Israel. You shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Oh, Moses was so sad. Just because for a moment, a few minutes, a seconds of short few, short temper, which, I mean, in the human level, it was justified. But before God, it was not justified. When he lost his temper, lost his patience, he was excluded from going to the land of Canaan. <sighs> what a loss. So let's learn from Moses here. Sometimes you're faithful for nearly 40 years or maybe by that time 39 years and just a short few minutes of fuels of anger cause you the most precious thing to enter the land of Canaan. So what do you think again? You're going to lose your temper again? You want to be irritable? You're going to lose your patience again? You need to lose patience. You no, know, slow to anger is one of the attributes of patience. So, do you want to risk some of your rewards that God has? In one moment of anger, you lose all of it. Think about the greatness of the loss. The next time you're feeling upset and angry, don't explode. Put a big scotch tape over your mouth. Go somewhere quiet, cool down. Or if you want, take the scotch tape and pray in the Spirit. Spend time quietly with God. Cool down, calm down. Find your peace, find your patience before you do anything. An angry person is not in a position to properly serve God. Anger has never been a good tool to serve God. It will actually destroy you. So this warning again, because Moses lacked patience, he lost part of the reward to go in. By faith and patience, you inherit the promises of God. Because he lacked patience for those few minutes, the promise that he will enter the promised land was taken from him. Other promises he has. So in your life, you might have a hundred promises that God wants to fulfill in your life. Because you lost your temper, because your impatience, you might lose maybe one or two of them, if not 50 of them. Every promise of God must be entered by faith and patience. So let's hold on to the fruit of patience. Don't lose your destiny. Don't lose any reward of your calling in God. Don't lose any blessing that God has upon your life. Hold fast to your patience and you will have your reward. All of it, 100% of it. Let patience be your virtue. Why not make it a goal? to be the most patient human being on earth. Oh, okay, some of you are frightened to pray that prayer, right? Because when you pray, you know you'll be tested. <laughs> but the reward is great. So be like Jesus and become all of the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit, including patience. God bless you and cause you to receive all the promises of God do you unto you. In Jesus' name, Amen.